All right, everybody, it looks like we are live. I wanted to go ahead and introduce IMC Trading. Can everybody, Casey, can you hear me okay? Cassie, can you hear me okay? Yes, I can hear you. And we have two more presenters who should be joining. Um, oh, perfect. Yeah, there's Jake. Hello. Awesome. Hey, Jake. And we're waiting for Christian right now? Yep. And okay. then I was going to share my screen. How should I go about doing that? Um, there's a button below on the oh, yeah. bottom for you to share your screen. Okay, awesome. Okay, perfect. So I'm just going to go ahead and wait about two minutes to make sure that everybody who's in the reception area or the event area goes over to our session this morning. But um, while we're waiting to start, if the attendees, if you can go ahead and put in the chat where you're viewing this session from, um, just so that we can see um, where you're all from. So you have Toronto here, Maryland, Montreal. Wow, we have a lot of London, UK. We have a lot of internationals here. India, Houston, New York, England. Um, Texas, Minneapolis, Vancouver, Romania, New York. All right. Awesome. So if you guys are excited for IMC trading today, go ahead and put hashtag IMC trading in the chat so we can see how excited you guys are. Um, get your questions ready. Today's going to be an awesome session. Um, so for those of you who are new to the URX uh, talent pro development program. Um, this program was developed over the summer by URX community, um, which consists of university recruiters and internship program coordinators from both the employer and the education side. And we just come together and talk about best internship practices. And due to COVID, we know a lot of students had lost their internships this summer. So we wanted to provide an opportunity for students to get some professional and personal development over the summer. And I am trading has a very exciting session with us today so um cassie jake and christian are you guys ready yeah we're ready um, okay awesome jake, oh go ahead and toss it over to you awesome welcome everyone thanks so much for joining our session today um i'm about to share my screen the only thing is i can't see the video while i'm sharing my screen so i just wanted to give jake and christian a heads up if you guys need me to move slides along just just say something because i won't be able to see you um but we can dive in here so here we go. All right, so we will be focusing today on essentially how we optimize speed at IMC. So um, you'll get to hear from me, a university recruiter, and then Christian and Jake as they talk about their roles within the engineering space. Um, so to start out, we're gonna um, just give some brief introductions. So Jake, would you like to go first? Sure, yeah. Um, can everybody hear me okay? Yeah. Um, so. I'm a hardware engineer at IMC, um, so I work mainly in the FPGA space. Um, I graduated with a bachelor's at, uh, of computer science um, and electrical engineering um, from U of I, um, and I interned at IMC previously. Awesome, Thanks, Jake. Christian? Hello, everyone. Um, yeah, my name is Christian Cygnus. I am a software developer at IMC. I've been here about uh, two years now. And yeah, I graduated with a, a bachelor's degree in computer science from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Um, and yeah, that's me. Awesome, thanks guys. Um, here's a quick slide about myself. So I work on the university recruiting team at IMC. I specifically manage a couple of our engineering pipelines at the campus level. So primarily hardware and systems engineering. I've been with IMC for a little over a year now and am also responsible for leading our university relations. So this involves a lot of event planning, just like this event and working with different student organizations and schools to plan events throughout the year to target talent on both the trading and technology side. In terms of my background, I studied at Vanderbilt University and previously held similar roles in campus recruiting at companies like Huron, Anderson Tax, and Deloitte. Um, I feel like I need to address the fun fact here just because of my photo. I'm a huge pop culture fanatic, so that's why there is a photo of me and Brad Pitt included here. She also has a good one of Nick Cage. It's true. I, I had a hard time deciding which one to pick, but I feel like <laughs> it has that more like wow effect. So yeah, moving forward then. Um, so I'm just gonna give a little bit of background on INC before we dive into the focus of the presentation, just to give you guys um, a little bit 
of Inside Scoop. So here is a breakdown of our timeline. IMC specifically started as a floor trader in Amsterdam in 1989. Um, since then, we have grown exponentially and became a global firm. So that really started in 2000 when we opened our Chicago office. Um, at this time, this is when we saw the big shift away from more of like the classic floor trading towards the screen and automated trading that we used most often today. Um, our Chicago often has office has since grown to be our largest office across the globe as well. So um, really excited to, to tell you a little bit more about what we do there. And then two years later, we opened our Sydney office. Um, so our Sydney offices manages all of the Asian Pacific markets, like in Hong Kong and Shanghai. So as a whole, Amsterdam, Chicago, and Sydney are still um, our three core offices today. And then in 2014, we became a designated market maker on the New York Stock Exchange. So we do have a small group of traders that work directly out of the exchange in New York but we don't have a formal office there. Um, and then lastly, just this past year, we celebrated our 30 year anniversary. So um, again, just been really interesting to see how much the firm has grown across these 30 years. Um, on top of that, our Chicago office is currently undergoing renovations right now. So um, although we're all currently working remotely, by the time we go back to the office, hopefully next year, we'll be in a whole new space. Um, so. Just again, excited to, to experience the change in size and also like feel the change in culture with the new office that's coming. Um, so here is just a breakdown of our locations that I mentioned. So like I said, US, US is our biggest office with 350 employees. Um, when it comes to all of our recruiting efforts here across the US as well, they're all targeted for our Chicago office. Uh, we're specifically based in the loop out of the Willis Tower. So tallest building in the city, which is really exciting. And then we have two floors in that building. Um, Amsterdam is still where we're globally headquartered today. So we have 250 employees there. Um, given it's our global headquarters, a lot of like our, um, some of the most important people in the company are based out there, like our CEO. Um, and then we also do a lot of like board meetings and trainings out there, especially as a new hire. So it's exciting to know that you definitely will likely have the opportunity to spend some time in Amsterdam at least in your new hire training or at some point during your career at INC. And then lastly, APAC refers to Asia Pacific. So that's our Sydney office with 150 employees. And like I mentioned, they manage the markets in Hong Kong and Shanghai. So now I just wanna to touch on trading at IMC just a little bit. Um, so IMC specifically makes markets in the major exchange traded products listed here. Um, the bulk of what we trade is within the option space. That's about 70% of the work that we do. Just to give you guys an overview of what it means to be a market maker. So essentially what that means is we aren't trading with anyone else's money. We're only trading with INC capital and we're working to set different buy and sell prices for thousands of different products like these ones listed here with the goal of providing liquidity, which essentially means we want more trades to happen. Um, so that's really our goal and who we're competing with are other market makers in the space. And our success is really dependent on how fast we can be compared to those competitors. So that leads me to technology. Um, so these are the three main trends that we really see within the trading space and kind of the three main areas that IMC focuses on and, and make sure to take advantage of in our trading efforts. So first off, software. Um, our software engineers at IMC work very closely with our traders to help develop the proprietary software that they use. Um, they specifically work in Java and C++, so Java on the strategy side and C++ on the execution side. Um, they're also probably our largest technology team at IMC. Um, at this point, I think our, our software team is actually outgrowing our trading side, which is interesting. And then next, moving over to hardware. Um, hardware is a bit of a smaller team at IMC, but equally as important. Our hardware engineers program on FPGAs to essentially make our trades as fast as possible. Um, so we have a group of about 15 or 20 um, IMC hardware engineers in Chicago. Again, um, coming from more like computer engineering or electrical engineering backgrounds and working primarily in system Verilog, and then they also do some software programming in C++. And then lastly, this data transport just refers to like basically how we're sending and receiving messages and data to and from the exchanges and kind of the different ways that we experiment with making um, that process as fast as possible. So we use things like microwaves, lasers, things like that, rather than like physical wiring like we did in the past. And again, this just makes that data transport um, as quickly as possible, like down to the nanosecond. Uh, so we specifically have data engineers, systems engineers, and network engineers at IMC that primarily work within this space. 
All right. And then before I hand it off to Christian and Jake, I just wanted to give a quick overview of the roles that we're hiring for currently. So right now we're hiring for 2021 um, full-time opportunities to start in either February or August of next year, as well as summer 2021 internship opportunities. So all of the roles listed here are um, we're, we're hiring for both full-time and intern, except for systems engineer and broker trader. Those two roles are full-time only. So if, if any of these roles sound interesting to you or you'd like to read up a little bit more on like what it means to be a software engineer versus a quant trader, I definitely encourage you to check out our careers page, that's careers.inc.com. You can read about the different jobs there and apply. And also, um, if you're unsure like of which role might be a good fit, you can definitely apply for more than one. All of our roles are completely separate. So, um, so yeah, hope to see your guys' applications come through. So that's it for me. I'm going to pass it off to Jake and Christian to tell you a little bit about speed optimization at IMC. So wanted to give a little bit of an overview about like, yeah, what does a high frequency trading company actually do? So it's it's a big buzzword that you probably hear a lot, um, but what does providing liquidity really mean? Um, so we are interested in buying and selling the same thing at the same time. So we are not really buying something with the intention of um, holding on to it for a long time and selling it a year down the line for a higher um, for a higher price. We are interested in um, making a lot of um, transactions on the buy and sell side of the same thing and making money off of the difference, off of things um, bouncing up and down by a little bit. So um, when there's a lot of volatility and a lot of volume um, going through the, uh, the markets is, um, is when we are doing the best. Um, so in order to buy and sell something at the same time, you need to know what um, what the value of that thing is. So it's really important to determine um, what the price of a certain financial instrument is um, in order for you to be willing to buy and sell around that price. So there's a huge amount of um, work that goes into creating like statistical models and, um, and like a lot of programming to figure out exactly what um, the price is for all the instruments that we're trading. And then once we know, we can see what is an, an obviously profitable opportunity. So if we think something should should cost a um, dollar and uh, someone is, is selling it for way more or way, or way less, like we can we can use that information to try to make money off of that opportunity. Next slide, please. Um, so. How do we trade? So uh, the picture that you see here is um, a little bit a, a little bit antiquated um, because this kind of assumes that a lot of the um, volume that's going through the stock market and the options markets are flowing through the pits, where people are physically trade uh, making transactions with each other using uh, using their voice. Um, things really don't happen that way as much anymore. Um, it goes through networks and happens on machines. So um, we have servers that are exchanges matching engines, which are their servers that are matching buyers and sellers together in order to make trades. So we will put our servers into the data centers that these exchanges have, um, and just so we can be as close as possible to those exchanges and um, listen to the opportunities in the market and then immediately react to send out orders. Um, to, to hopefully make a profitable trade. Um, yeah, so feeds and orders are um, sent via like normal network connections in the data center, um, like mainly over ethernet. Um, right, so yeah, so when we're talking about speed and all of these transactions, one thing that becomes very important very quickly is how we manage all of the data flowing through our systems. So I wanted to give you a little bit of the idea of the type of uh, data workflow and loads that we're really dealing with here, um, because it, it's one of the uh, areas where you know the word big data is very appropriate. So at uh, IMC, in terms of just the sheer amount of data we're processing per day, it's over 50 terabytes um, that's flowing through our systems. 
And uh, that's you know a lot of different uh, parts of the system working together and responding to the 10 plus million trades that come in per day from all of the various exchanges we're connected to. And to give a little yeah, concrete detail on the network side, we're dealing with about 10 million messages every single second of operation. So uh, optimization for speed and throughput and being able to handle all of that data is a huge problem that we look to solve through various means uh, at IMC. So go on to, okay, cool. Uh, so here's a, a little bit of a graph of uh, our connection to an exchange throughout the day. And as you can see, the um, load of messages coming in from any given exchange really uh, fluctuates quite widely throughout the course of the day. And as you can see, there are also some particular peaks that can happen in the middle of the day. So can anyone uh, guess what that uh, peak at 10 a.m. is? And just for a uh, sake of expediency, you can you can guess in the chat. But if we go on uh, to the next slide, that uh, that was when Trump tweeted. So even stuff that are is out entirely outside of our control, like it, entirely random events, can dramatically affect how busy the market's going to be and how many messages we have to respond to. So not only do we have to build our systems to handle huge flow, but also be able to yeah go from extremes of you know less data to more data and be you know able to work with those type of rapid peaks that can develop so now uh yeah jake will tell you a little bit about uh our specific approach yeah so um now hopefully we made it a little bit more clear about like what kind of trades we're hoping to make and what information we're, we're really dealing with here um, when we are trying to make trades. Um, but it's important to note, like, why do we want to be fast? Um, so uh, a big thing is like markets move quickly, as you can imagine, when those when those Trump tweets came out, um, there were a lot of um, financial instruments that were going berserk and moving all over the place. So we want to be able to very quickly modify our pricing uh, um, to take advantage of those opportunities. And that is kind of twofold. One, we want to make sure that our pricing isn't stale so other people don't, um, don't try to make a trade with us that we think is good at the time and then turns bad after we realize that everyone else knew stuff that we didn't. The other side is kind of more on the offensive that if a big market um, shift happens, we can, um, we can take advantage of that if we know about this um, opportunity sooner. So we can um, go in and hit on profitable opportunities in the market, um, which will um, which will only happen for a brief period of time before the market adjusts. Um, so um, at, at the same time, um, when when customers want to trade, like if you go on your phone and you're typing in something in a Robinhood, um, oftentimes companies like us will be the ones on the opposite end of that trade. So um, we want to make sure that we can give you the best price that's possible. So um, oftentimes that means that when you post um, when you post something on Robinhood or something, we can very very and um, give you a, a better price than other people because we really want to trade with everyone. Um, so so that's another big reason why we want to be fast. So. Um, for this presentation, we're going to kind of go through um, a little bit of a, of a thought exercise about this is like an overly simplified problem that, um, that people at IMC would need to solve. Um, so we're kind of going to kind of go over um, what it would look like in order to write a very, very basic algorithm um, that would react to events in the market and send something out as a result. Um, so in this example, um, we have this we have the packet on the top, um, which is the feed that's coming from the exchange. So we can see that there's the first eight bytes of that is the ID, and then the second eight bytes is a price, um, and we don't care about. So this data is going to be coming in as a as a UDP packet from the exchange into our systems, and then our systems need to read that packet, understand what it says make a decision about if we think this is a profitable opportunity or not, and then send out a response 
that contains a decision about um, about if we want to trade with this with this um, opportunity or not. So this is kind of like the overall problem statement um, that we can solve kind of at many different levels. Um, so we're going to kind of start off at the at the highest level, um, which is Java, and then we're going to kind of work our way down the stack all the way into FPGA and kind of understand the pros and cons between these different systems to solve a similar problem. Um, so a couple things uh, that are interesting about this example before we move forward. For one, um, these are the, the feed packet is 500 bytes, which is um, quite large, especially considering that it's coming over one gigabit ethernet. Um, so if you wanted to be fancy, you can um, do some napkin math yourself and figure out how long it takes even to receive that packet on the wire, um, how long it takes to serialize those bytes on a wire. Um, and then on the output, we can see that the decision period comes at the very end of the packet instead of the beginning. Um, so maybe keep in mind what, um, how that could be useful and, and what advantages there might be to that as we uh, move along with this presentation. All right, so yeah, to dive into the Java side of things. So first of all, a little bit at a high level, why might you want to use Java? So uh, one of the biggest things with any high level language, whether you're talking Java, whether you're talking C Sharp, or even languages like Python or other things you might be familiar with, is that these kind of high level uh, languages have a rich set of data models and libraries. And it's also just overall easier to come up with an idea and implement that idea in a very rapid uh, approach versus some lower level languages. Like if you're thinking about C, it's gonna take you know a lot longer just because of you need to implement a lot of those uh, data models and everything like that. So Java, is really easy to manage across uh, a large code base and also just really develop quickly uh, with the tools that it gives you. Um, and it's also very easily testable, uh, which is kind of a huge thing when you have a huge code base and you wanna make sure if you make a change that the entire system doesn't go down. So that type of rapid development is super easy to do in something like Java. Um, however, that comes with some downside. So. If we you know, just talk about the example that uh, Jake was giving, if we tried to uh, approach the problem of you know, breaking down that packet and trying to make decisions in Java, not only do we have to read all of that off of the wire, but we also have to do actual Java deserialization to get it into a class, kind of like the market opportunity class that I am showing there to make sure we set all of the fields correctly and do the processing. and that can get a little bit slower than we would want for a split second uh, response. And in addition to that, it's also non-deterministic at runtime. So with the JVM, you have a garbage collection, you have hot code that can be compiled, but some, some of the code isn't compiled. And there's just a lot of uh, yeah, non-determinism at runtime, which can result in, you know, if you have three runs back to back of the same code, they can vary somewhat drastically in between each run of how long it's actually gonna take. So um, that it's also harder to reason about, yeah, what the actual hardware is doing because of all of the abstractions uh, that Java gives you on top of it. Um, in addition, there are some other things that are kind of specific uh, to Java that could be a disadvantage, like you only have, um, you only have like generics that are implemented with type erasure. So you have some limitations in the type of stuff you can program. Um, and yeah, overall, like you just have to deal with uh, issues like runtime polymorphism and other stuff that you wouldn't uh, have at a lower level language. And all of this is gonna add to a little bit of the bloat and the inability to run quite as efficiently as some optimized C or C++ code. Um, yeah, and, but at IMC, right, we do use uh, Java. So, you know, I said all, said some good stuff, but I said some, you know, drawbacks of Java. So you might be thinking, yeah, like, do you, would you even use that? And there are a lot of things that we can do to make Java an even better language to work with. So one of the first examples of this is at IMC, we use libraries such as 
Mutables and Jackson to make some of our serialization and deserialization easier and also uh, allow us to write a little bit less verbose code because anyone who's written plain Java can know that when you're defining fields, then constructors, then getters and setters, it can get a little bit uh, excessive. And so we use some of these tools to eliminate some of the boilerplate and make things more understandable. And then in addition, uh, we can also look um, and fine tune the GC performance to kind of get to where we want to be. So I said, you know, a downside was the GC behavior, but if we carefully use uh, programs like GC Viewer, as I'm showing in the example here, we can see what the JVM is doing, how memory is getting allocated, and fine tune what GC algorithm we're using, and also the parameters for that algorithm, and get to choose, like, do we want to optimize uh, memory load? Do we want to make sure that you know we're having high throughput? We can really decide the type of parameters we really want to tune for. So we yeah pick systems and then tune the exact parameters for that specific system and how it how it should operate. And then in addition, um, on the actual language side, as I said, uh, one of the great things about Java is all of the tools that kind of come around it. So first of all, for Java itself, there are a lot of ways um, it can be written in a cleaner way to allow just more maintainable code. So at IMC, we really push um, push Java to the most up-to-date version. So right now we're on a Java 11 migration uh, with our eye towards yeah, 12, 13, 14 in the future. So staying on top and really knowing the language, knowing what operations are efficient, not efficient, and just knowing what you're dealing with can get you a long way in terms of optimizing it. Uh, an example of that would be you know streams versus for loop iteration, where streams provide you with a very expressive uh, set of tools, but also come with some memory impacts and can be less performant than just a simple for loop. So really knowing the optimizations that go into it can also help you write uh, better code. And also knowing all the tools around it. So at IMC, we use IntelliJ, which is an extremely powerful IDE that can really help you with debugging, with finding issues in your code, um, and also writing it. Like there are a ton of different uh, uh, options to have it like automatically fill out portions of the code and just make your life easier. So knowing your tools can also allow you to iterate on your design really quickly. Um, and then finally, just making sure that you know what third party libraries are available to you and really utilizing those to their full potential. And with a combination of all of these things, you can actually write Java that is both pretty performant for the type of tasks that it's best suited for, and also allows you to really rapidly develop it and rapidly push out new code on a daily basis and be very confident that that's gonna work. Uh, so after we learned about learned some stuff about Java, we can kind of move down the stack a little bit um, on the C++, which um, tends to be a little faster for some key reasons. Uh, so the first big one um, is a deterministic cold path. So um, Christian was talking a lot about uh, garbage collection and um, how that could result in some non-determinate, like the tail latencies of, uh, of, of some of your operations. Um, that will not happen in C++ because garbage collection is uh, managed much more explicitly. Um, so uh, the, really, there isn't any garbage collection aside from aside from what you uh, from from what you're explicitly doing in your code. So um, that's a huge advantage. Um, and there's also um, a lot more compiler optimizations um, because C++ is a um, is fully uh, is fully compiled instead of Java's um, running on a JVM. Um, there are a lot more um, interesting um, optimizations that you can apply using the compiler and by coding a certain way to allow the compiler to optimize the resulting assembly code more. Um, so that's a big advantage. Um, and then you can definitely much more easily interact with lower level systems. So all of the, um, the code that interacts with our FPGA are written in C++ because it's just uh, C++ is a lot closer to the metal of the computer um, and it's much more easy to directly manipulate memory 
and, um, and interact with the kernel and, and, and other things of that nature. Um, so C++ seems great. It's not perfect, though. Um, so there are still a lot of limitations that you have um, just by running software in general. So um, for one, um, in order to receive um, this packet that, um, that, we're, that we have from the feed, it's still going to take some amount of time to receive the packet uh, at all. So um, I left a little thought exercise to you guys. How long would it take to, to receive a 500 byte um, packet over UDP um, with one gigabit ethernet? It's around four microseconds, which sounds like a super small amount of time, but actually ends up being an eternity when we're, when we're working on these timescales. Um, and then after you receive the packet um, on this network card somewhere on the computer, you have to CI Express to the processor. So before C++ has even touched any of this data, you're already five microseconds behind. That is super slow and, um, and puts you at a, at a disadvantage. Um, so there, there is kind of a floor that you reach when, um, when, you're dealing with, uh, when you're dealing with just like writing software in general. There's also some more um, lack of determinism in terms of like cache misses. So if you guys are familiar with some of the lower level details of how processors work, um, they have uh, multi-level caches. So um, if you are trying to access data or access um, some CPU instructions that are not in your low, uh, your nearest cache, it could take um, hundreds of nanoseconds to go out to main memory and, and grab that data. So um, it is more deterministic than Java, but not fully deterministic. Um, so here's uh, the uh, simplified version of the C++ implementation of, uh, um, of this problem. Um, and what's, what's interesting to note is um, in between these two if statements on top, you see this reinterpret cast. Um, so if any of you guys are familiar with, uh, with some of the ways that C++ works, a reinterpret cast doesn't really do anything in terms of memory operations. It's just, um, as it's saying, reinterpreting the memory that you already have. So what's really cool about this is that once you receive the memory from the speed packet, um, what you can do is reinterpret that memory as something else and then perform operations on it without incurring the penalty of copying that memory to a different location. Um, so that's like a major optimization that you, can, that you can have in C++ that you don't have to do a lot of these expensive memory operations and you can still place. That's something that um, C++ is really good at that it's much more difficult to do in Java. Um, so there's still a lot of innovation that, um, that we do uh, in the C++ space. Um, so for one, we really love templates at IMC. Um, so I don't know if you guys have spent a lot of time um, writing C++ uh, so far, but um, templates are um, a really interesting and exciting and powerful feature of C++ that I didn't really know too much about before I got to IMC. Um, definitely the C++ that I used in college was nothing like the stuff that I do, um, that I do here. But um, it's very interesting um, how powerful templates are and how it allows you to have uh, kind of compile time polymorphism, um, that it's, it's much faster in some ways and it allows you to do some stuff. Um, and as I was mentioning before, how, um, how you can have a cache miss, um, and that could cause some latency. Uh, you can, if you um, program in a specific way, you can kind of be conscious of the cache that you have, and you can change the way that you program to try to minimize the likelihood of you, you even encountering a cache miss, which is more interesting. Um, and we really like to adapt new C++ versions. So we're always on the bleeding edge. There are actually people at our company that um, have uh, that go to the C++ conventions, and some have actually like introduced new features to the C++ spec. So we really love um, being on the cutting edge of C++ and always kind of pushing the limit and using its new features, which is pretty exciting. So now onto the lowest lowest level of the stack, um, FPGA, um, which stands for Field Programmable Gate Array. So basically, um, for, for anyone who doesn't know what this is, 
I kind of like to think about it as like a bunch of hardware Lego bricks that um, when you write code, you are kind of telling this chip how to stack all of its Lego bricks together to make this like cool robot. Um, so you program in system Verilog, which is very different than most other um, software programming languages because um, in software like C++, when you compile down your code, it turns into like ones and zeros to assembly language that's actually running on your processor. When you write system Verilog, it compiles down into a circuit. So um, it's, it's kind of a fundamentally different thing that you're, instead of um, writing an algorithm, you are describing hardware. You're describing a circuit with, um, with, with, their, with your code. So it's, it's kind of an, like a mind bending kind of shift in, in the way that you approach how you're gonna solve a problem, but it's pretty cool. So you have all these configurable logic blocks um, and this routing logic in between. And what makes this so powerful is that um, this, we have these really powerful programs um, that figure out how to take your code and map it onto these configurable logic blocks and make all this routing work. Um, so it allows you to kind of create these custom hardware chips um, just by reprogramming the way that these, um, these blocks are connected together. So it's not as fast as a fully hardened chip like an ASIC, but it's extremely configurable. And that allows us to, every day we can change the code that's running on our FPGAs and allow us to really keep up with the times and make iterative improvements every day. So how does an FPGA solve this problem? Um, so for one, not only do we have no garbage collection, but there's no cache misses. Um, it's, it's the most possible deterministic um, way of solving this problem because you are, you're in control of cycle by cycle every single thing that happens on this chip, which, um, which is pretty cool. So instead of, having, um, instead of having microseconds of tail latencies, like you have maybe a few cycles of, of, of tail latencies, which is, which is pretty interesting. The other huge advantage is that the data doesn't need to go over PCI Express anymore. So before you had this network card that would listen to the data, send it over PCI Express into your processor. The processor would listen to it, make a decision, send it back over PCI Express to the card and send it out. Here, um, all of it's contained in the same thing. So you don't have to send it over PCI Express anymore and you can cut out all of that latency, which is pretty powerful. Um, there's a lot of problems though. Um, it's much, much more difficult and slow to develop in um, hardware land than in software land. So all the time, the project that I spend most of my time working in, um, I've been on this team for two years now, and the software model for the algorithm um, is like a few pages of C++, but it is thousands and thousands of lines of code that me and many other people work on in hardware. So right. Implementing quite a simple sounding algorithm can be very difficult and complicated in hardware, um, but the, the latency and, determinis and determinism advantages are unparalleled. Um, it also doesn't, it's not like you can just run this by itself without anyone else. You still need a large software stack in order to run it correctly. Um, so you need to have all this Java layers and C++ layers that are constantly communicating with the, with the FPGA to um, keep it up to date and um, keep it informed about what's going on in the markets. And then obviously, debug. like you don't have an, uh, we don't have oscilloscopes sitting around tapping into every single wire on this thing. Um, so you're not going to be able to run GDB or some kind of debugger. Um, you're it's so you, it's much more challenging to debug when things go wrong. Um, so innovation um, comes in a lot of different ways. So uh, one big one is that now we don't need to read, we don't need to wait for the entire packet to come in before we can start reading this data off of the wire. So if the data comes at the very beginning of the packet, then we might know what we wanna do, um, how we wanna react before the entire packet has, um, has finished being sent, um, which is really powerful and it allows us to really dramatically improve our latency. Um, it also just allows us to um, parallelize things a lot more. So if we um, like have this decision that we need to make way down the line, um, 
maybe we can uh, can compute two different things at once and have them all ready to go in parallel. And then at the very end, we can choose which one we want to we want to um, select. So um, hardware is much more easily parallelizable than software. Development, it's really cool that we have um, continuously integrating continuous deployment um, for hardware. I think that's a very rare thing. Most of the time when you're writing hardware at a place like Intel or NVIDIA or something, you're gonna be waiting maybe two years before the hardware that you write is actually gonna make it onto a chip. Um, we have a much smaller feedback loop. We can go down to a day uh, between when I can merge something and when I can see it actually in production um, interacting with the exchanges, which is really, really exciting that you can kind of have that short feedback loop for hardware. Uh, and iterative improvements, you can um, do a lot of things to kind of reimagine what your strategy is like and how you can change your data dependencies and change the scope of the problem in order to improve your latency by, um, by switching around your data dependencies and, um, and being smarter about the way that you uh, pre-compute your data and, and things like that. So there's a lot of, the, the, it's, never, it's never ending in terms of what optimizations you can make in hardware. So we've talked about a lot of different uh, layers to our software stack um, throughout this presentation. And it's something that yeah, comes up a lot. I've seen it in the chat. And you know, when we're talking about this, a very common question is, you know, okay, well, hardware is really fast or C++ is really fast. Why don't we just do everything there? Like why, why use Java or why do, you know, why have this exact breakdown of what we're doing? And really it just comes back to we want to use each layer of the stack for the type of tasks that it's best suited for. So, you know, if we tried to take all of the strategy logic that we have in Java and put it in a, let's say, put it in an FPGA, not only is that in and of itself, that task gonna take many, many, many years to complete. By the time you're done that design, it's already gonna be like obsolete. You're gonna to have to have something new. Um, so, you know, hardware takes the most time to develop, Java takes the least time to develop, and everything in between has their own purpose. So at IMC specifically, Java is used for a lot of our strategy level systems, which are the why or kind of how we want to trade. So looking at what's our position, how do we get out of a position once we get into it, you know, how do we adjust for certain risks like Delta or other Greeks that are associated with certain positions. All of those type of higher level ideas, you know, you might have the downside that Java is, you know, less deterministic and you have to deal with garbage collection, all of that type of stuff. But if your latency targets for those type of calculations aren't really, really tight, then it makes sense to do it in Java. It's really easy to develop and you can get the implementation quickly, iterate on it and the speed of development is a huge benefit because you know as it's the landscape is constantly evolving. So when you do stuff in Java, as the market changes, as conditions change, you can rapidly evolve that. So if you don't need extremely low latencies, Java makes a lot of sense to use as your development platform. And then as we move down in our latency stack you know, with C++, uh, a lot of our systems that are connecting to exchanges, dealing with orders and all of that kind of low level uh, connectivity, that's C++ because you have a ton of data that's coming through and you also need to be able to respond in a fairly quick manner and just to manage all of that data going through. C++ makes a lot of sense. It's very low latency, very deterministic and you might not have as much of that uh, GC headache that you get in Java. But to go down in that latency bracket, you trade uh, development ease. So while C++ is not necessarily you know, super difficult, especially compared to something like uh, System Verilog, it still takes longer to work with. So uh, you're still not going to want your entire system that to be written in C++ because you're still then going to be a slower at developing new strategies, new ways, and uh, of trading and being able to iterate on that quickly, but it does make sense for the certain layer of our you know, exchange connections, all of our drivers that are you know sending orders and stuff like that. Um, and then we get down to hardware where it takes a long time to develop a really complex thing, but if we 
take kind of the most crucial steps and put those on our in our hardware layer that will allow us to be at fastest exactly where we need it but not waste development time and we can still you know iterate more quickly on design if we really choose specifically the exact stuff we want to put on the hardware to be as fast as possible so all parts of the system they make sense you just have to know know your tools and know how to use them to most effectively uh, leverage their pros and cons. And uh, then, yeah, just uh, a fun thing at the end of this presentation, just going over some cool perks at working at IMC. So we got free lunch every day. We got free breakfast and snacks, weekly massages. Uh, this is kind of slower. OK, work at uh, Sears Tower. Um, and a bunch of other stuff that we'll put on the screen now that is just makes working at IMC an absolute blast. And you get to work with some of yeah, the smartest people you've ever met and just have an awesome time with yeah, really dedicated individuals. And I've just yeah, loved all of my time here. I'm sure Jake can say the same amazing stuff about IMC and our culture. And it's just a great place to work. So with that, uh, yeah, I'm not sure how questions work here. We've been answering some in the chat, but we're open for any uh, general questions from any of you guys. Yeah, I'm going to pull up the chat and see if there's anything that's come through. Yeah, well, I can I can address. Um, Nandan asked a question about OpenCL. Um, so uh, for those who don't know, OpenCL is a um, a language, it's open compute language, which is a language that's um, intended to, I believe, to be used mainly with GPUs, but just to interact with um, with other hardware acceleration uh, tools. Um, that is something that's quite useful for a lot of um, for a lot of people, but it's not exactly what we want to be doing because um, we need to be making very specific um, optimizations to uh, to proprietary hardware systems. OpenCL is uh, by definition, like more generic and meant to be used for other other people's um, uh, computation acceleration. And um, the tools that we're building and the optimizations that we're making are much more specific and they um, would not be as good of a candidate with OpenCL. I can uh, answer. There's one. Uh, Bill asked if IMC sponsors visas. And I'm, I mean, Cassie can elaborate more, but the answer is yes overall. I don't know if you want to give. A yes, we do. Um, IMC is e-verified as well, so it makes the process extra easy for us. Um, but yeah, we're, we're open to providing sponsorships. Um, we've hired a lot of international students in the past. So yeah, good news there. And also, uh, what are common mistakes new hires make? Uh, I can answer that uh, really quickly. Um, you know, first of all, I wouldn't say that there's any common thing that's just everyone will make other than just getting to know the system itself. So especially, let's say, it's going to be different. The same answer is going to be different if you're a trader, if you're a hardware engineer, a software engineer. But let's say on the software side, which is where I am, um, our system is just massive in terms of the number of components, how they interact. And it's yeah, super complex to just know everything. So as you're starting out as a new hire, sometimes you will uh, make mistakes of just omission, not knowing that this system talks to this system in a certain way and then not implementing something correctly because you didn't know how that interaction uh, happens. So a lot of it's just really starting to know the systems, get comfortable with how everything connects, interacts, um, and being really open to learning and doing code reviews and yeah, just expanding your knowledge as much as possible. But yeah, you're always going to have those times where you make a mistake because you didn't know how two systems, uh, all of the different ways two systems could interact with each other. Um, you know, I'll just piggyback off of that a little bit. Um, I just think, in general, um, the only mistake that you can make uh, when you're starting off is not asking enough questions. Like, um, probably my favorite thing about working at IMC is how how um, not hush hush information is. How you can just walk up to any person that's that looks to be doing something interesting and um, say like, hey, what are you working on? And they will talk your ear off for like an hour about everything that they're doing and how it's relevant to you. Um, and that's really beneficial. And like our best employees are the ones that um, know the system really well, understand how everything interacts and how they fit into it. Um, so uh, we really encourage learning not just about what you're doing, but about how you're going to affect the greater, the, the bigger system. So just asking a lot of questions um, and engaging help is is really important 
I also see uh, in the chat, uh, Song asked how our work-life balance is. And I think, again, that kind of depends on your exact role. So I can really only speak to mine. But overall, I would say we have a really nice balance in terms of, you know, we kind of, on the average day, let's say when we're back in the office, most people on my team at least get in around like 8.30 plus or minus a little bit and then leave at like anywhere between 5.30 and 6. But especially the nice thing um, with us being a global firm and having all of these offices that can offer 24-hour support is that for me at least, you'll almost never get like a you know panicked text in the night like, hey, you need to log on at 2 a.m. and fix this system. We have employees working 24 hours a day by how we have our offices laid out that really once I'm done work, I'm, I'm done, I can just relax. So I found find it really great. And we also have like a lot of company events, like every Friday we have a happy hour with food and drinks and all of that type of stuff. And I have lunch with coworkers. So it's it's really a nice balance. I, think, um, I saw a question about, um, about CICD on FPGA. Um, which is quite an interesting uh, question. I think it's probably one of the more unique things about, about how hardware works at IMC. Um, it's really cool what we do. Um, we use a, a tool called Verilator, which um, compiles our hardware into a C++ functional model that allows us to write unit tests and, um, and integration tests that interact with this hardware. So instead of writing a lot of system Verilog test benches, which can be a little bit clunky, um, we do all of our testing and integration in C++, which allows us to much more easily use the CI CD pipelines that the rest of the company uses. So we are on the same upgrade schedule as, um, as everyone else at the company, and we are using these, um, these verilated models to help us verify our code all the way through the build pipeline. Also, a question I saw that I liked was, is there a critical time each day slash week that software needs to be shipped due to trading time constraints? And I think that's a really interesting question, and it kind of relates to an answer I gave previously, is that, yeah, at IMC, especially at the Chicago office, we are trading, you know, during the week, we're trading 23 hours a day because CME, that's uh, how long they're open. So there actually is a window where a lot of our upgrades will happen, and that's during the CME maintenance window. So every day from 4 p.m. to 5 p.m. Central Time, uh, CME is down for maintenance, and that's where we target a lot of our uh, upgrades. And you know, but we're we're upgrading the fingers crossed every day to a new uh, version of the software. So it's yeah, we're we're definitely going quickly, but there is a period where we need where we would need to schedule those uh, upgrades. It's it's kind of funny that, that you say um, that the question is, is there a critical period where we need to upgrade for certain trading things? It's Sometimes it's almost the opposite, where if there's a really important thing in the market, sometimes we'll pause our upgrades and say, okay, we really don't want to accidentally introduce a bug right now, so let's pause our upgrades for a day because we know that the market's going to be really busy, and then the next day after things calm down, we can resume upgrading and um, and try to roll through the, uh, the new features. Um, I see uh, there's a few questions about like uh, what skills were are looked for for software engineers and how kind of the hiring process works for full time. Cassie, do you, do you want to take some of those? Sure. Um, so I saw a couple of questions in there about experienced roles. I think if, if you're interested in experienced roles, where I'm a little bit less familiar with that process being on the campus side, but I know we are constantly hiring experienced engineers and traders. So those roles are also posted on our careers page. Definitely encourage you to check them out. Or you can follow up with me through email, and I can connect you with our experienced recruiters as well. Um, on the campus side, so specifically for software engineers, we're typically looking for candidates with a background in computer science or computer engineering. Um, although our engineers at IMC work in Java and C++, as Christian has mentioned, the, the interview process is, is meant to be more um, kind of the language of your choice. So um, you will be asked to complete an online coding assessment right when you start, but you can use whatever programming language you would like for that assessment. Um, and same goes for the rest of the process. I think we're more just looking for someone who has object-oriented programming experience that can you know, pick up new languages quickly. Um, outside of like those key technical skills that we look for on the software side, we're also looking for candidates with strong communication skills, especially because you're going to be working with traders on a daily basis who might come from a different background than you. Um, 
fortunately, our traders are pretty quantitative and technical, um, but some come from a physics or math background, so maybe aren't as familiar with programming. So it's important to be able to communicate effectively with someone who maybe doesn't understand all the same technical topics as you. Um, outside of communication, then, I think it's, it's just important to be you know, highly motivated and, and like working in a fast-paced and challenging workplace. Um, as, they, as they both mentioned, IMC works very fast, very short feedback loops. So we want someone that's willing to keep up with that and also willing to share their ideas and you know not being afraid to challenge others um, you know, if they disagree with something. On the hardware side, uh, honestly, it's, it's a pretty similar process across hardware and software as it relates to like interview stages and whatnot. Um, for hardware, though, I think we're more often looking for students with backgrounds in computer engineering or electrical engineering. Um, you also definitely need to have some experience working in Verilog, System Verilog, or VHDL. Um, the first step in the process on the hardware side is to do an online assessment where you'll be asked to write code in one of those three languages. So um, just really important that you've at least taken a couple courses or have some work experience in that to be able to effectively get through that assignment. Um, and then again, in terms of soft skills, I think those are the same across the board, the communication, working in a fast-paced environment, um, you know, being driven and, and open to share your ideas. Um, I also want to address one other question I saw that came through. Someone asked if traders need programming skills. Um, so I would say that most of our traders come from like a technical background, as I mentioned before. So either CS or math, physics, stats, um, and they do do some programming in Python. So it is good to have at least like a baseline of programming experience in Python for traders. Um, I also saw um, a question uh, more specifically asking about uh, qualifications for a hardware role. Um, and they sing, it says, seems like Ethernet and PCI Express seem to be extremely relevant. I would say just like networking in general is extremely relevant. So understanding Ethernet, IP, TCP, UDP um, is, is very important. Um, but then it's, but that's really stuff that you could learn. I think the most important thing is having very strong digital design skills um, from the get-go. Um, and then we would be happy to teach you any, any more specific knowledge that you might need, like PCI Express or, or um, networking protocols. Also, so I don't know how much, uh, we have two minutes left on this clock. I don't know. Yeah, we we'll take like, two more questions. So Christian, take whatever one you were gonna take there. Yeah, uh, I just wanted to respond to Song since he specifically asked uh, how software engineering at IMC is different from traditional tech companies. And I just wanted to, it's a huge question, so I can't get as into it as I would like, but I would say you're still going to get exposure to a lot of really interesting problems, new technologies, and all of that type of stuff. But you're in an environment where you can affect change really quickly because there's not as much of the bureaucracy that you see at a lot of large tech firms in terms of how much approval you need to push a thing into production. At IMC, you know, every day you're pushing changes that are going into production. It's, it's like a lot easier to develop. And also since IMC, you know, trades with our own capital and all, we are our own clients. So that gives a lot of flexibility in how you develop and being able to evolve the system over time without worrying as much about like backwards compatibility or supporting old versions, stuff like that. All right, see our URX organizer is here. So um, I'm assuming Hi. time is up. I'll let you jump over. Okay, awesome. I know I was, I, I, I didn't want to interrupt. I, there were a lot of questions coming in and this discussion was great. So um, I just wanted to say thank you again to the IMC trading team for being here today. Um, the conversation was great. A lot of great questions and engagement coming from the students attending this call for this session. Um, so before we end, I wanted to announce our resume review winner for today. And that is Aziz Ma Alimov, um, Aziz Alimov. So you'll go ahead and get an email from me connecting you with a member from the UARCS community to do um, a resume review. And then um, we'll also send out information in regards to our upcoming events. Um, we have a tech talk with Bose next week uh, product marketing with Epsilon, and we have Kate McRoberts um, doing a session on how to show your difference, how to be different from your other um, colleagues, other applicants when it comes to applying for jobs. So um, that is the end of our session, and I hope you all have a good rest of your day, and thank you again, IMC Trading. Yeah, thanks for having us. Thank you. Well, bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.